Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. It's that time to welcome you back to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Uh, Don sitting in the host chair today, joined by show contributor. That would be Chris Capola. Chris, how are you doing today? Good. Yourself? Uh, overall, pretty good. I was just thinking as we're getting the recording going here, you and I have been talking off podcast here for probably for about 45 minutes. One of these days, what we're going to do is we're not going to do an episode. We're just going to start the recording and let people hear the episode pregame and let them decide what they want to do after that. That may be something that we need the behind the scenes look. I may have to sneak a recording in on them, get your get permission later to use it. But we've had a, we've had a fascinating conversation that has covered, I think, three and a half millennia in the last forty five minutes, give or take. And now we're going to come down to the actual subject that we're talking about today. Not not just that, we went from like twilight of history to British opium wars to, I mean, it was it was you know what you know you always hear right in time travel. Well, okay, you're t- traveling time, but you're still going to be in your physical location. That's the other right. thing. We it was we we it was broad. <laughs> we went everywhere. So I just share that to say that's one of the things I enjoy about doing the podcast. One of the reasons I enjoy having Chris be a part of it and and having those conversations that all of you don't get to hear, but but that we get to have, which is sort of fun. So today this is episode one hundred, Chris. And we had talked a couple episodes back that when we got to episode 100, the challenge we were going to undertake, you you accepted this challenge. I think I can find the audio to prove it, was that we've talked so many times about the course of history and the course of events. And we kept coming around to my question often, could this have avoided World War II? And then you would very clearly look at me as we share the video here face to face and say, well, no, <laughs> nice try, but no, it's sort of inevitable. And so we've thrown out the challenge of, is there a way to do that? So today, on we're going to take a little bit different approach here on episode 100. We're going to, we're going to we're going, in my mind, we're going to invert the process a little bit. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Then we'll take the break and then we'll come back and do it. So normally what we do here on Fork in Time is we take a moment in history or what we call the fork, the point of departure for traditional thinking about alternate history. And then we change that. And then we say, so this is where the road used to go left. This is now where the road goes right. So we take it from the fork and then we go forward, normally covering in a classic episode for those, you know, covering the what did a little bit. And then we cover the what if, and then we come back around and bring it all together. Today, what we're going to do is sort of start and go backwards. So again, the premise is we have the ability to travel through time somehow and do some things. And so our goal is to avoid World War II. So now we're going to go back and figure out where that fork needs to be and how we apply the proper pressure. In other words, we're going to go back and we're going to think through and and sort of a elucidate on what that fork might need to be in order to do that. So we're going to take the inductive other direction approach today here on a fork in time with the end goal of accomplishing what I asked Chris and challenged Chris to do, which was, can we find a way to avoid World War II? So if you're interested in that as a concept, stick with us through the break and join us when we come back. Don and Alexis taking a little break from the podcast today uh, because we talk all the time about what are we trying to build out there, Alexis? A community. A community. A community has more than one element to it. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we've uh, come to enjoy over the course of doing the podcast here for slightly more than a year and a half now, wow, is uh, getting to know people that have found us on the web and not become listeners, but also become contributors and become some of our friends in the podcast community. Uh, recently, and we featured him on one of our episodes, and we were featured on one of theirs, we uh, uh, had a chance to encounter Brody Burton. And Alexis, Brody has a podcast, and what's it called? Imagine If. Imagine If. And so we wanted to once again just mention that, uh, again, in the spirit of what we said we're all about, being being true to that, we're about a community. So we're suggesting to you again, if you found our podcast and you like it, but perhaps you did not hear the episode that had Brody, uh, you're having a chance once again to hear about Imagine If. One of the things that astonishes me about Brody is Brody is a young man. Brody is, I think, a freshman in high school. 
and he's chosen to do this at a very young age and he's doing it very well. So it is worthy of encouragement and worthy of us of, of us uh, suggesting that, uh, that you want to be a part of that. So uh, you can find it, do a Google search. Uh, there'll be a link uh, in this particular show and in other show notes. There's a link on our website. So if you go to www.aforkintimepodcast.com, you'll find links that will get you to Brody's podcast. But again, we want to be sincere about saying that we're looking to build a community here. So part of that is, is pumping up and suggesting there's other other things out there. And Brody's podcast is different than ours. You may find you'd like it better or, or worse, or it's just that it's different. But we would encourage you to check it out. Absolutely. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alderman History Podcast. The next voice you're going to hear is that of Chris Coppola. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Who's joining me today uh, here for episode 100. And as we set up before the break, we're going to take this inverted look back. And the goal today is to see if we can create a fork, a rash. Now, you, we should say right up front here, Chris, you believe you have high doubts that this is even possible. We'll get through that when we go through the exercise here. But trying to find an actual fork that is, you know, uh, practical enough and possible enough that it's actually plausible enough to go down the path. There's three P words. And uh, so the question is World War II. So what is your thought potentially on where we go apply the fork to avoid World War II, Chris? So... Let me just say this. I, 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 you know, one of the things we've talked about before is the ideas of man versus kind of movement, uh, forces of history versus individuals. And one of the first things when you think about alternative history or time travel is the question of would somebody go back and kill baby Hitler? And I'm going to be perfectly honest, that does not affect anything. I am definitely on the side of movement. I am on the side of, you know what, it was going to happen. If it wasn't him, it would have been a Strasser or a Drexler or, you know, there were other people in Germany kind of doing similar things. Um, the most logical and the best, I think, kind of point to do it is Versailles, is the end of World War One where they sit down after Europe has tried to commit collective suicide and try and piece something back together. So the, the key in your mind is to go back to Versailles. We've talked about this so many times. It's almost a recurring theme on the show. You've heard me say this a number of times. I think of World War One and World War Two as being basically the same conflict with a little bit of a, there was a halftime or there was an intermission to some degree, although it wasn't even a full intermission in the middle. Uh, they um, and so they're 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 connected events, no doubt, uh, in all, all kinds of ways. And the participants, some of the same people, some certainly some of the same countries mm -hmm. are involved. So we're going to go back and look at what you would do differently than at Versailles. So you mentioned when we were getting talking off podcast about this, that that's one V word. I have another V word in my head, and I think you know where I'm going here. So. There's not only been just one conference or negotiation or output in European history that begins with a V. Versailles is one of them. What's the other one? The other one, you you challenged me because I want to think of a third one now, just just to be <laughs> just to be obtuse. Just, but just, um, oh yeah, yeah. But 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 the other one I'm thinking about is, and and the other you know the beautiful thing about it is it happens. 104 years before. I mean, I think in other podcasts that we, we, we've we had, uh, you've had to correct yourself whether we're talking 18 or 19. This is very hard to confuse whether you're talking 1919, but this one was 18, 14, 15, and the Congress of Vienna. Okay. So remind our listeners, so I think most of them probably have some sense of this, to remind our listeners what causes the Congress of Vienna to come to be. Napoleon. Yeah. So um, this is not the first. This is not the first time there's been a dominant military engagement. Someone looking to to dominate all of Europe. That, that that's been done before. Yeah, it's it's you know it's it's a little blasé by this point. Um, basically, you know. The Congress of Vienna is Europe getting together to put the pieces back from what Napoleon had tried to do and what the French Revolution had tried to do. Basically, 
to some extent, it was trying to turn the clock of history back a good 30 years before actually to kind of turn the clock back to the way things were after uh, Westphalia, which, by the way, depending upon which language you are speaking, Westphalia and Versailles could start to done. So, so there, there you did it. And, and I see by the expression on your face, Chris, you are very proud of yourself for having yes. done that as you should be. So the Peace of, peace of Westphalia, the Vienna Congress, uh, the Versailles Treaty or the Versailles Conference. Interesting how we use different terms around all these things too. One was uh, the Peace of, one is a Congress. And I think that's actually a, con a concept I want to come back to, the why it's called the Congress of Vienna versus the, Ver the Versailles Conference. Because those are really... I think there's a lot contained even in what they're called there, to be honest with you. I, 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 now that I'm thinking about it, I feel like that actually is why I feel like one was successful and one wasn't. Um, yeah, those two words conjure some images in my mind that we can get into. <laughs> yeah, so the short story, which is always giving you know something a little bit of a short shift to, so the, what is the short story of what the Congress of Vienna produced? The Victorian era, um, the longest peace in the history of European great power relations. And, you know, there's a couple there. There's there's footnotes to this. There's Crimea. There's the wars of German and Italian unification. But for almost 100 years, um, you hadn't had a full on fracas. You and and that's also important looking at what had happened previous to um, even Napoleon and all of that. Every 10, 15 years, you have a, you know, full on everybody is at war with each other. And this basically established a system of great power relations that was able to maintain a balance amongst each other and stop full on coming to blows for longer. If I'm thinking about it, it may actually be the longest period of peace in Europe. Even right now, we're still only 70 years from kind of the post-World War II settlement. So, hey, let's hope we keep that going and break the streak. But they did establish the record back then. Right. Which is interesting because, again, the other thing that popped into my head there, just thinking back to uh, the Hundred Years' War, which lasted for slightly more than 100 years, um, <laughs> they've managed to fight for longer periods than the peace was able to be maintained consistently yeah. over a period of time. You know, 30 Years' War, 100 Years' War, that, that's not been uncommon. So this is post-Napoleon. This is this is the European powers gathering together to decide what the post-Napoleon European world is going to be like. So who's there? Who are the players? Um, you have Austria, which you know had completely been almost beaten. If 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 Napoleon's winning a battle, it's kind of 50-50. The Austrians are on the other side of it. Um, but somehow they're still a thing and they're back. They actually are hosting the conference. You have um, Alexander of Russia, who for the first time, Russia has really become a first rate fully, you know, they're in the mix. Uh, you have Talleyrand of France. And, and this is one of the really important things. He Talleyrand representing France. He, he had been working with Napoleon and you know what? Here's the new boss, same as the old boss. He just changes his business card and starts working for the Bourbons again. And also you had Castlereagh, who was the British foreign minister representing them, setting up the balance of power. And also you had uh, the Prussians and, and, you know, the other Sweden, I believe, was there. So you had everybody present. And, and the one thing that comes to mind is thinking about the word we use for it, like you said, it's a Congress. Um, it was a group of people getting together, making deals, and coming up with a decision that everybody could live with. 
And they did live with it for a very long time because everybody present could deal with it, could could accept it. Right. And so one of the things and so one of the things I know we were talking about off podcast is um, there were there were deals made there that, that carried forward for so long that we would still recognize the outcome of what was discussed and agreed there, what was negotiated there. And I think that's the key word, mm-hmm. what was negotiated there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When, when if you fast forward to the conference of Versailles, when I hear conference, I picture the meeting room at a, you know, Marriott or Hilton hotel where you've got a dais of three or four people speaking and couple hundred people out there sitting in uncomfortable brass chairs that actually is kind of what happened at versailles you had the speakers dais of france italy great britain and the united states speaking to everybody else there i mean you have representatives a couple of weeks ago we did an episode on ho chi Minh, and you know he was there trying to get um, recognition for Vietnamese independence. You have, and we haven't touched on this much, but you had, you know, Lawrence of Arabia and his, the the leaders of the Arab revolt there advocating for Arab independence and all of these other countries that are invited to the meeting, but they're just, I, I just picture them out in that sea of people that are being, spoken to by the conference the select few that are the speakers at the conference right they're they're, they're the speakers and there are the there are those who are allowed to speak and then there are those who are there to really just listen yes and and and, and be happy that they've been allowed to be there to listen in some ways you know you, you got the ticket to that so how did i guess the other place i want to go again just in some cases, I know covering things here that are obvious to a lot of our listeners, but are worth exploring. What are the primary ways that Versailles sets up World War II? Because we're going to go from the study of what would you do differently at Versailles. So what are the seeds of World War II that are sown, not only sown, but planted and watered and given good good care at Versailles at the end of World War I that, that set up the situation for World War II? So just thinking about this, thinking about those people up on the dais. Come World War II, Italy is a sideshow. France was overrun in a matter of weeks. Great Britain survived by the skin of its nails. The United States was there, but basically walked away from Europe. So if you look at the big power players, Germany, the Soviet Union, and the United States all are not really brought in and kept and engaged in that system. Germany is, you know, we we talked about Talleyrand, and that that was one person who I brought up earlier. At Vienna, he, the representative of the defeating of the upsetting power, was brought in and was told, okay, listen, you can't keep what you took, but we need you to be okay with whatever settlement comes about. And you know what? We'll make some concessions to you, and we will get your buy-in. Um, Germany was given a piece of paper and said, if you don't sign, we're going to start fighting again. That's, that's very different. And the other part of it is if you think about you know, the Soviet Union, Russia, none of the powers that we just talked about even recognized that nation's government's right to exist. They did not have relations with them at all. Um, yeah, in fact, I, that was something actually just in the last couple of days, I saw the date when the United States finally recognized the, the Soviet Union. It, it's in, in my head, I guess I'd never picked up on the fact that it's it's much later. It was FDR. FDR did it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is which is, you know, that's well over a decade <laughs> later for those of you that are scoring at home. Right. So. Mm-hmm. And I think you brought up something interesting, which was the concept there talking about Talleyrand representing French interests, even though they were the offending, defeated party, clearly so. 
the reason we're having the Congress is this has to be dealt with because they were the aggressive power that had been, Napoleon had now been defeated twice because <laughs> he got out and tried it again. But the, uh, but that they're represented at the table, the concept there, the Congress versus the conference that we've already hit upon here. And also, I think what's important, you and I talked about this off podcast is who does Talleyrand have to sell whatever he comes to an agreement there with at the, who does he have to sell that back to? Louis. Yeah. A party one of guy. one guy, uh, a monarch, because this is mm-hmm. still, you mentioned the Victorian area. This is the Victorian, the Victorian era. Yes. He can get those words out of his mouth is that this uh, obviously is transitioning into more of what we think of as being the modern evolution of democracy. The American revolution has happened, but you know, it's still a Republic that's trying to figure out what it's all about still hasn't had its great conflagration that's still yet to come in a few more years, further figuring out what that's all about and what it is. But again, the rep- the nations that are represented there for the most part still are monarchies. And oh. while we were talking about this off podcast, you know, Britain is probably the most democratic nation that exists. And what is its form of government at this point? Um, its form of government is somewhat, you know, a... It's a form that would be recognizable to us. Um, the monarch was somewhat responsible to parliament and all of that, except here's the here's the kicker. Um, and and I, I, I may have put a little bit of a fine point on this, but Castlereagh, the British representative, the foreign minister, what percentage of the British population could actually vote for him? This is one thing that had even in the United States. And, and you know, this is one thing American history students sometimes miss this is still the period when you had to own property there was a tax requirement you had to pay this and i do find it interesting that that's coming out right around tax day almost (laughs) but you had to pay a certain amount or you were not allowed to vote so even the most democratic person even the most democratic government in europe had a very small group of its population that it had to answer to that that had any say in how that country ran and and in what kind of deal they would find acceptable coming back from vienna right and again that's the most democratic of the major powers the great powers that are represented there russia that's not I, an issue. I mean, yeah, there's still that's... there's still people there that are in like Sun King territory of believing they're almost like Roman, you know, deified living representations of God. Right. Yeah. So that's that's the situation at the Congress of Vienna. And again, now we're going to contrast that again back to Versailles because that's the whole point here. What's different at Versailles? Just about every power represented there was elected by a relatively universal mandate. It's interesting to, you know, not not to not to anger Alexis and to thumb my nose at her, but I will I will point this out. The British representatives at um Versailles were still not elected by universal manhood suffrage. They still had not removed the property requirements in Great Britain until the 1920s, but at least it was a lot lower um, in a lot of the other countries. Uh, I'm thinking about Clemenceau's France. Um, I don't believe there was a property requirement and there was a much wider franchise and it was a lot more important to respond to the people. And to an interesting thing that I was thinking about is to some extent it's because of the, the Napoleonic Wars. They set things in motion that came to fruition at Versailles. Um, there's an old quote from Napoleon that he can spend a hundred, you know, he can spend 10,000 lives before lunch. And he could because of the levee en masse, because of what, um, France had been able to do kind of when Napoleon is starting, it was still kind of the Republican government, but he kind of took it to its logical conclusion of 
this idea of a nation at arms where you can just arm everybody and that allows you to you know when you're looking at that versus these I'm going to talk about the Prussians because they were kind of the archetype of this, but a small, professional, very well-trained force. Technology had reached the point that if you can get a bunch of people and line them up and give them a couple of, you know, give them a month or so, you can get them ready to go out there and you can just swap these professional soldiers that had kind of been running around Europe since Westphalia. Um, and the fact is it wasn't, it, it hadn't happened by Vienna, but once a nation state, once a country needs you to fight for it, you have some leverage with that government. Right. Uh, you, um, you have, you have an investment in what happens and the, the, the smart leadership there realizes they need you invested in whatever you need to be invested in because of those reasons. Yes, yes. And to carry that forward, you know, we have this. I'm not trying to be overly pedantic. It wasn't Victoria yet. We still got almost 20 years before she comes in. But right. we have this era of peace and exp of peace and nationalism in Europe and that popular participation in government, this idea that the people have something to say about this really does take over, is able to grow and spread during this peace so that by 1914, just about every government goes to a parliamentary system to declare war and be voted war credits. Right. So um, e e even the power to start these things has changed in the in the intervening 100 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a noticeable way. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So to focus on, we have our magic. We have our magic fork in hand now. So what do we do differently at Versailles, Chris, to to cause a different out cause a different outcome? We welcome Schneiderman. Um, we welcome those representatives of the German Republic, of whatever government happens to be in Germany at that point. And the reason is this. Um, like I said, give them a stake because what Versailles did, and I think we've touched on this a little bit earlier, of Versailles was the worst possible outcome because you didn't go in and have a Carthaginian solution for Germany where, you know what, we're just going to split them up and Germany's not going to be a thing anymore. We're going to go back to Prussia, Bavaria, Saxony, all of these, you know, you're, you're not allowed to be a thing anymore. While at the same time, we didn't take the softer approach of, of a Vienna where you're welcome back into the system. What you did is you left. Uh, I'm reminded a little bit of the Yamamoto, Yamamoto quote about the United States. We have awakened a, a giant and filled him with a terrible wrath. That's what you did to Germany. You left. You didn't take away their means to start trouble in the future, but you made sure they wanted to start trouble in the future. Yeah, you didn't take away the means, but you gave them reasons to uh, to. Mul on multiple levels to and then particularly once they're you know the, the other big intervening event obviously between the wars i think that gets lost you know instead of united states history we think about the great depression and what that meant but that there, there was there was a global economic upheaval in the middle of all of this so you know whatever whatever seeds you had planted there if they were going to be watered and cultivated and grow as a result of economic issues you had that coming to make that happen so, by the way, one other – before we get to that, you also left out the Soviet Union. It is a – it is Russia. It is a huge power on the border, and it also has no stake in what happens at Versailles. But the other thing to think about is this. What caused the Great Depression? What caused that run on the banks? And one of the things that caused that run on the banks was in the late 1920s, the United States had started buying – 
German government bonds. Why did Germany have to issue all of these bonds to pay the Versailles reparations? Right, right. Why was why was Germany borrowing? Because Germany had to pay money. Yes, yes, and and so you could definitely make the argument of a welcomed in Germany doesn't have that massive inflation, doesn't have democracy having a horrible name to people. I mean, I'm thinking about you know. Just, just to kind of give a modern um, spin to this, if you look at the average Russian today, looking at what Putin is doing, Putin puts bread in their stomach. Um, democracy meant collapse. Democracy meant bread lines. If democracy doesn't mean bread lines, it, it, right. it, it yeah, it can grow and it means something different to to the people of, of a country. I think, I think that's a valid point. So is there a particular thing that comes to mind other than the general concept of having Germany be a partner in the peace, not the not the object of now this is what's going to happen. We're going to have a say, or even if they don't have as much of a say, at least they feel like they're having a say, because part of it is also the psychology of that. In your mind, are there any particular things at Versailles that have to be undone that you know, if you want to get down to a specific what that would be, and territory is obviously part of it, right? Um, that's actually something uh, uh, we did talk about off off podcast. The one, the two things are, well, a couple of things. One, the war guilt, the the forcing Germany to admit they were solely responsible at at Vienna. We all knew France was responsible. We didn't have to have anybody say it. it, it that, that doesn't, you know, the, the, the forcing of Germany to admit that they are responsible and to assume all of the economic burden, um, that, that just, you know, that, that's the single thing I think that, that really set up um, the future. The, 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 Interesting thing that I, I think I mentioned off podcast, when it comes to territory, if you look at a post Versailles map of Europe, I'm going to go ahead and name some countries. They look exactly the same. Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, the entire split up of the entire Austrian Empire, the outlines of Yugoslavia, at least to the outside world, you know, there have been their changes since then. This is area this part of europe that had been basically the cause of whatever fighting there had been in europe not only was it settled it was settled in a way that has lasted to today the the territorial adjustments were basically germany and russia eating up chunks of poland those were the two countries that were not welcomed into the post Versailles settlement. So if you welcome them in, if they feel like, you know what? Versailles, we had a part of that. We, we had something to do with that. Um, they don't have this axe to grind uh, about the world settlement. And that makes a difference. It makes a big difference. I mean, there there's a reason that the the beginning of the Second World War is Soviet Union and Germany joining together to destroy Poland. See, see, see previous couple of minutes of discussion to figure out why it's those folks exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then and the other thing we talked a little bit about was. Uh, I'm trying to remember exactly the context you and I talked about this was the was the one of the things that did come as a result of really Versailles, uh, but also what happened afterward is that borders are drawn, boundaries, mm -hmm. th things are created that come together. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk yeah. a little bit about that? Um, like I said, the entire Austrian Empire was divided up in a way that works to this day, even after all of the changes 
all of the bloodshed on you know Germany's western borders. Basically, the 1919 settlement is today's settlement. So, um, territorially, Versailles actually kind of lasted, but what it didn't, but it's it's its fundamental flaws were the economic burden put on Germany and the chip on their shoulder that they really had this idea that you got us last time, but we'll, we'll come back. We'll come back at you because we really don't have anything we've gained in not upsetting the apple cart. Right. And so as a result of that, there's an apple cart. Let's, Let's flip it and and let's flip it and see what happens. You know, uh, the the fact is Germany is just so central to Europe economically. It is so important. Um, you, I don't know that you can have Europe without it. If you try and ignore them, if you try and keep them out, it it it's you're you're spinning. You know, you're you're that old. I guess it was. I'm trying to think of these these acts. You know, would make it on Ed Sullivan of the person running around spinning the the plates on on uh, sticks. That's what you're doing, and th that is not sustainable. Right. <laughs> for any for any enduring period of time, without right plates are going to crash. Yeah. 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 And, and and then you have the cleanup from the plates that are going to crash, which is, you know, the other part that's there. So the conclusion that we've reached here in this little inverted way of trying to attack this is, once again, without changing this important fork point in history, it's inevitable. Yes. But if we could change this, I absolutely can deliver on my promise and finally <laughs> say, you know what? I don't think World War II would have had to happen in any format whatsoever because many other times I've said it can change and people will change sides, but I think we finally have found a way to stop it. Great, wonderful. Please do not stop the podcast right now because there's a big <laughs> but coming. Yeah, and the but is it's not that, – that's not practical I, based upon I like, what you're saying. I like my my mental image that I've already created of the guy running around spinning plates because that's kind of what I feel like right now. I, given the forces, given where people were, I don't think that that is. <sighs> we finally found a way to do it. I just don't. I I don't think I don't see it happening. I I don't see how we could have made that happen. Um, and. The reason is what we had kind of previously mentioned, which is the nature of these powers had changed. Um, the fact is, I mean, there are statistics in Britain about basically every family lost somebody, a, a, a very close relative. And by the way, Britain got off light compared to a France, compared to a right. Germany and other countries. And... You know, we talked about that democratization of violence, that that a modern industrial society has to dig deep and bring out these people and recruit them and get them marching towards what the state wants. And to do that, the state has to give them a say. Um, and thinking about just to use the french example like we said talleyrand had to answer to um I, was it louis the 15th i believe one of the louis i believe it was 15th he had to answer to one guy a bourbon um clemenceau the french premier at versailles has to answer to millions of voters and every single one of these voters has had somebody in their life taken from them by the Bosch by the right. Germans and 
have having and being able to convince them to forget that to welcome Germany back into a society to convince them to not extract their pound of flesh from Germany. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think about the German government, the Weimar government, and it, it was still working itself out, but basically the German Republic came back from the, from Versailles with a settlement and, it was so unacceptable to the German people that that government fell and, and for the rest of the existence of the Republic, the Republic had brought back this horrible peace and was constantly blamed for it. The fact is, if you have a Vienna-style settlement at Versailles, guess what? Instead of the Weimar Republic being the discredited the you know poisonous it, it feels almost the foreign imposition of a government it's the french third republic um mm -hmm. clemenceau's party is gone the french will not forget what germany did and uh, real world I, I, it's 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 impossible for them to accept it right and so you know this is you know the thing that's running through my head is you know so often it's a, the fun exercise of what we do with alternate history to go down these fanciful flights of various things. And, you know, again, it, we, we have the privilege of it's alternate history. We can sort of, you know, play fast and loose with the boundaries and the rules, but then there's real politic, there's the real world, there's reality. And, you know, we talked a little bit about this, you know, we, we mentioned a couple of times here, the episode about Ho, which was a great listener suggestion and something worthy of discussing. It's, you know, and we talked about, well, there was the two opportunities for home. It, mm -hmm. The first one almost has, I think I asked you to give me a, a scaled number, almost has no chance. Well, the second one after World War II, well, maybe there's a little bit of a chance, but but still even not super practical. I, I, I actually think, in all honesty, I, I feel like the second chance might have might have actually, I, it's, it's, it's not a certainty, but it would have, it, it's really interesting and it's a really plausible thing if we have a different American government that will listen to it. But, you know, I think all, all podcasts, a plug for our previous episode, Negated Nukes, the reason I – that is that is if I ever talk to somebody, that is my favorite episode. I tell them to try that because that fork, I feel like it was very, very – possible it was a little bit of a a little bit of a hidden gem yeah but it's very plausible um this and, one and, and yeah and this fork that we're trying to apply back is a is a plastic fork at best trying to do something that you need a medical a metal fork it's, for. it's it's the it's the plastic fork that gets thrown into a takeout bag that you you wonder I, I always feel a little shamed when I get home and see three or four of them in the bag. And the, how many people do you think I'm feeding? But but that that's a different story. I, I think I think I know what it is. Yeah. It's the um, um, it's the spork. Yeah, yeah. It it's it's, it's not quite spork. a good. It doesn't quite work as a fork. It doesn't quite work as one. Yeah. This this is this is the spork. <laughs> In fact, I think we now have settled. It took a while into the episode, but if, if you listened all the way through, you'll understand what the title of the episode is because I'm now going to going to find some way, shape, form, or fashion to get spork into the title of the episode. This this, this may be called a spork in time. That may be what this episode I, is going yeah. to be Yeah. I, I, I wanted initially, and I, I think you heard from the very excitement in my voice of the Westphalia, Vienna, Versailles, that alliteration. No, I like sporks now. I think it's a spork in time. Yeah, the the, so the centenary so, so episode is a spork in time. A spork in time, which couldn't make it even, which would make it even more you know, really take a spin yeah. upon itself. I like it. So again, if you if you if you listened all the way through and I hope you did, now you understand what the title was. Yeah. This this is this is the spork in time. So uh, good deal. Chris, anything else you can think of that we want to throw in on here uh, for this particular episode? Not particularly. I mean, I think I think this is a, this is a fun idea. This is an interesting idea. 
I, I always find myself trying to pull it back to trying to come up with plausible ones. And this was a fun one, but I delivered on the promise. I found a way to stop World you War did. II. You, 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 you did. It's I, just, I, uh, it's just we got we we we've got to build a better sport. I I do think it's an interesting you know this is something else we've talked about is the the man versus the movement, um, and the forces are so set that it's almost going to happen. And I just completely discount the idea of going back and killing baby Hitler to make that happen. I don't see how that does it. Yeah. I I don't think you know. And again, I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's so easy when a lot of people approach alternate history especially from like the science fiction genre approach is that you know you just go back and you know you do that one magical thing and then you know that changes everything and it ignores we've we've actually had this conversation though brant and i had this conversation Mm -hmm. you know whether you subscribe to that great the great person in history concept or the the broad forces of history concept i go back and forth on certain things but to the point of this episode there were forces that were in place that it, it wouldn't as you said it wouldn't matter it would be a different name. We, we, we would revile a different name today other than Hitler, but there would yeah. still probably be a name that we reviled and uh, for all the reasons that were there. So good. Chris, I again, one of the great things, Alexis and I were talking this, this past week, one of the great things we've enjoyed about now 100 episodes into A Fork in Time is getting to meet the people that we've met along the way. Chris, I just want to say thank you. Uh, I've enjoyed getting to know you as, as we have a little bit over the last year and look forward to what's moving forward. And... Uh, they're, um, I'm, I'm actually I'm almost to the ridiculous point of giddy about excited about the top the title for this episode. I can't wait to post the title as <laughs> uh, as a spork in time, and then figure out where it goes. So good deal, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Uh, again, we have some real exciting stuff coming. I've got four or five guest hosts, including some a college professor and some others mm. that have agreed to appear on the show. So. We know the shows are better when it's not a monologue with Don talking or even when it's just our normal cast of characters. So I uh, think there's some exciting stuff coming and we do we do appreciate your support. But you know where to find us on the web, www.aforkintimepodcast.com and all the stuff that goes from there because if you've listened to one episode, you've heard that every time. So we invite you to do that now. So signing off, Chris. Again, thanks for joining. I'm going to sign us off here and we're going to suggest as we always do, if you happen upon that fork in time, what might you want to do? Take it. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash aforkintime or follow us on Twitter at A-F-I-T podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash aforkintime. We hope you will join us next time.